Okay, so 2 p.m. Um, if you can hear me, it's always uh, the daily practice. Uh, you can raise the hand. Okay, so the voice is working and you're, you can hear my audio. So it's fine. So, okay, let's start from the um, the inbreeding, which is the session three and five. And this is the uh, last um, topic for uh, the population invitation uh, session three. So what we're going to learn today is I'm going to introduce the sort of the basic concepts of inbreeding in human population. And then we uh, discuss about how to measure these inbreeding patterns from our uh, population or the genome. And also what is the implication in inbreeding. And as usual, we have some uh, learning material from the, um, the book and also some articles you can download from the, uh, the university uh, internet. Okay, so uh, the first topic is the inbreeding in human population. So if you think about the, um, the Charles Darwin, um, you probably uh, get some information from whatever the, um, the high school science book or uh, his biography. Um, Darwin actually uh, married with the, the woman named Emma Wejud, he, I mean, one of his uh, cousin, and they married early times and they have, you know, multiple kids, 10 children, and, you know, uh, three uh, children died early days and uh, two, two actually died in two years old and, and one died in, I think, 10 years old, 11 years or someday uh, because of um, certain illness. Um, I mean, uh, now these days we know that the sort of um, expected cause of this death because they are cousin marriage uh, and, and this cousin marriage are uh, increase the chance of having sort of um, the recessive um, disorder in the, in, the, in the children, but that time was quite, you know, new to people. So, um, I mean, Darwin and, and, and his partner, I mean, always thought about the situation, how they understand their, you know, kids' uh, death uh, by their cousin marriage. So if you look at their, uh, the pedigree and, and, I mean, the cousin marriage um, of the Charles Darwin's family with the uh, Emma's family, they, they're from the same, you know, the lineage. So, um, I mean, it, it, it could be quite surprising given the, you know, the time, you know, I mean, especially the Korean society, we don't really see the inbred um, the family because, you know, I mean, it's, it's not legal in this country. But uh, at the time, the cousin marriage was, I mean, that common situation in the society. So uh, people married with um, sort of um, the similar family or certain um, socioeconomic background. So that situation uh, brought us to the important uh, terminology called inbreeding. So inbreeding is a non-random mating commonly found in human population. And why I describe this is common because, you know, the, you know, people prefer some, you know, the mating situation like, you know, physically or culturally or social preference and they married because of their region, right? So, I mean, we're not going to marry any, you know, the partner in the population random chance, we, we have definitely some preference for the uh, mate selection. So um, the non-random mating is quite common in human population. And, and, you know, I mean, especially like Korean drama is one of the <laughs> stereotype for the, uh, the non-random mating situation because, you know, like, you know, Sky Castle or whatever, the penthouse, these things all, you know, based on our long history of that, 
uh, sort of non-random mating situation. And also we, we call this non-random mating assortative mating, right? So compared to uh, animal or plant kingdoms, you know, humans are, you know, prefer to be uh, choose some mates in the in 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 their you know adulthood times, and they you know achieve their uh, sort of um, preferred mating. So uh, I mean, in the context of genetics, we we can say that these non-random mating violates uh, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, right? So that's why we when we learned about the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, we say that you know non-random mating situation is quite old in the in a natural population, especially in humans, right? And also in addition to this, humans has generally small population size. So we don't have the infinite numbers. So compared to like, you know, insects or fish, human has, I mean, tiny bits of uh, the population size, right? And also uh, in a mating situation, we have sort of um, geographical um, limitation because, you know, we're not going to marry, you know, I mean, the different part of the globe. So we, we, we normally find the mates, you know, close to your um, uh, uh, environment, right? And also um, some matings has been, had been happened between close relatives, right? So, I mean, probably for Korean students, this cousin marriage or close marriage is quite surprising things because South Korea is one of the country strictly, you know, regulate the situation way before the, you know, the modern age, right? So, you know, under the, you know, um, 12th century or 13th century, we already has the uh, Confucianism from the, um, the South China. And, and I mean, that bloody Confucianism dominate our country. And, and I mean, people's philosophy, I mean, as to, you know, religion or cultural things, it's all, I mean, quite restricted, right? And the marriage is one of the things and, and cousin marriage is one of the things people not really think of like, you know, the true virtue. So, you know, I mean, if you marry with your cousins or even like second cousin or third cousins, you know, I mean, people always mock around them. And I mean, those people not really, I mean, the perceived in the society, right? So cousin marriage, was really low you know, rates in our society. And also, you know, after the, you know, the modern society, after, you know, the legalized and, and cousin marriage is not allowed in, in our country. And, and that was quite restricted, like, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, like, you know, if you have the same surname, you're not gonna marry with that person. I mean, I mean, to these days is is ridiculous, but um, that was happening in, in our country, and that law was you know uh, destroyed in in 1997. But you know until that time, South Korea was one of the society restricted situation. But if you look at other countries, um, they they different, right? So if you if you look at the rate of cousin marriage, I mean definitely South Korea is one of that low bounds. But other countries like, you know, North America or Europe or other, you know, uh, countries in, in Asia, they have certain level of the con consanguineous marriage or close marriage. Uh, and, and while I prepare the, um, the lecture, <laughs> I also read some, you know, the pages on Wikipedia. And, you know, this is about the uh, legal status of cousin marriage. And if you look at the, you know, um, I mean, whether the society allowed cousin marriage or not, like most of the European country or, um, or Canada or South America, they, they allowed first cousin marriage, but you know, like Korea or China, they strictly you know, banned that situation. Okay, and so, you know, given the time, I mean, uh, when Charles Darwin lived, um, cousin marriage or the close marriage was quite common. And I mean, Darwin didn't really, you know, notice that, you know, cousin marriage is um, disadvantage, right? But after, you know, having, you know, multiple children and the loss of the three children from the, from his days, and he really cared about, you know, um, probably the close marriage or inbreeding is something, you know, harmful in, in, in the natural population. And he did research on that. And, and also lots of the geneticists, they still working on that situation too. Okay, so we have few uh, terminology 
uh, describing that, that inbreeding situation. So one is the consanguinity, which is the mating among relatives. For example, it's first or second cousins. So literally the marriage of the same blood. And also we call you know, endogamy, which is the marriage within a population or community, right? So, um, I mean, we, we also looking at the, the level of endogamy due to the religious situation or cultural situation, right? So, and, and then the opposite to uh, consanguinity or endogamy, we can also think about the situation called como cosmopolitan population, which is the population are not isolated and typically urban population like, you know, you, right? So, I mean, lots of, you know, people, especially like higher education, they move to um, the big city and, and they live there and they settle there and they meeting uh, or they mating with others, you know, growing in a totally different geographical region, right? Or even these days, you know, I mean, I mean, we have COVID situation, COVID-19 situation, but, you know, before the COVID-19, we traveled to other countries and we married with someone with totally different, you know, backgrounds, right? So these days we can say that, I mean, we're living in a cos cosmopolitan uh, population era, right? Okay, so what we can find cousin marriage or close marriage, uh, one example is South Asia. So like, you know, the South Asia, um, the India or Pakistan because of their multiple tribes and, and also the, the existence of the castle uh, system. So they have, you know, their own unique, you know, isolation of, the, um, of their population and the high level of the cousin marriage as well, right? Uh, and, and because of the region, uh, lots of, you know, anthropologists and, and geneticists, they moved to, um, they're going to India and they look up their genetic patterns and also um, the influence of the cult cultural background. And another example is the, um, the migration of some, um, you know, the people, right? So like, you know, uh, Anabaptists, like Amish, Mennonite, Hutt, right? As I you know, explained multiple times in the lecture, they're also one of the examples of these uh, close marriage and, and also examples of the embryonic population. Okay, so what, what is the, um, the sort of counter examples of these inbreeding populations? So, you know, the opposite situation is the total, total random mating, right? So random mating, like, you know, you, you married or you find mates, whatever you've, you know, meet in certain environments, right? So that situation we call the panmixia. So panmixia is the random mating rather than mating structure by geography, ethnicity, socioeconomic status or other factors, right? So human, care about you know um, the socioeconomic status or religious background or certain you know cultural preference even like an ethnicity but you know the some animals in 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 natural population natural environment is not right so like you know uh, the one of the uh one on example is the eel right so eel is like a long fish i mean some people might like it and they they do almost total random mating. So they don't have any preference. So they, they mate whatever they meet in the, in the uh, nature, right? So that, I mean, the, the studying is, is one of the one examples, you know, um, uh, we can model the panmixia in, in genetic studies. Okay, uh, so how to measure uh, these inbreeding patterns? So you can think about the situation called co coalescent lineage, right? So this is the situation uh, where an allele is passed from a common ancestor to your generation or to certain generation, right? So we can put one question. So if you have an allele uh, A and the allele also found in your friends, right? So uh, then question became how we identify this allele a are from the same ancestor, right? So this A allele, allele A could be just the same uh, genotype rather than from the same ancestor, right? So if you, if you want to answer that question, then you have to understand two terms. So one is identity by um, descendant and the other one is identical by status, 
right? Okay, so what is the identity by descendant? So identity by descendant or IBD uh, describing the situation, some parts of the chromosome in different individuals are identical by states because these two, um, these two uh, parts are, were inherited from common ancestor without crossover, right? So for instance, if you look at here, these two individuals here, and if you look at these parts like here and here, then you get the uh, same, same uh, segments in the chromosome, right? And these chromosomes, not just the same you know, composition, it actually from the same person, which is the, same, uh, the common ancestor, right? So two or more alleles are IBD if they are identical copies of the um, same ancestor allele in a base population. And this IBD can be estimated for at least a single loci in a uh, diploid individual or between individuals, right? So I, if, you, if you know about the IBD situation, then you can easily track down, you know, whether these, you know, whether these genomic parts are same uh, from the common ancestor or not, right? So one of the easiest uh, starting points you can think about is the uh, comparing the 50% genetic sharing with you, right? In that case, you call them mom or dad because you know you, you share 50% of your genetic background with, with your mother or with your father, right? Because we, we have the additive genetic relationship between mother and father because we get the one strand uh, of an allele from your parents, right? So if you put that relationship, which is the A, X, and Y, is the proportion of layers that X and Y have in common IBD. So you can easily say that the percentage of the genetic sharing between parents and you is the 50%. And the between two full sieves, which is between you and your brother, you and your sister, is also 50% chance, right? You can also think about the a dominant situation between the sibling. But here, if you describe the IBD, you can only look at the additive genetic relationship because this additive factors is commonly uh, used as a, you know, the measurement unit across, you know, whatever the relationship between parents and offspring, uh, siblings or the cousins, right? So additive is the situation of you can measure the segregation um, um, transmission. And also, if you look at the two hot seeds, which is the cousin situation, then you can expect the 25% is the similar, right? The reason is that we have the 50% chance of the, the identical uh, genetic sharing because of the Mendelian segregation. So this 50% can be uh, used as a coefficient, right? Uh, used in the, uh, in the formula then you can use this 50% in, in each genetic distance, right? So between parents and offspring is the one degree. So you use the 50% as it is because it's just times one. But if you have um, like the two distance, which is cousin, then you can expect that that has to be 50% times 50%. So it has to be 50% to two. So that's going to be 0 0.25, 25%. Okay, so IDB again, uh, sorry, um, the, uh, that is the IBD. And what is the IBS? IBS is merely describing the situation of whether these two alleles are identical or not without considering where they are from, right? So IBS um, is a term used in the genetics to describe two identical alleles or two identical segments or a sequence of DNA. So it's literally, describing whether these two uh, uh, proportion are look same or not, right? So this is one example is describing the IBS and IBD. So we have the common ancestor here, right? And this ancestor has the G allele at a given locus. So this locus ancestor has a G allele. And if the mutation happening and that change G allele to T, right? So that is the happening in here, then it, it changed the G allele to T, like in here, right? And then 
base population used for the uh, estimation of IBD coefficient, which is the um, this part, right? Then after that, you you measure the uh, the parts on here, right? Then in in the current um, generation, then you observe the multiple population like in here, right? Then you can compare whether whether the whether the uh, the segment containing the locus has the same allele or not, right? So if you look at the five populations, then you can you can easily say you know these three population has the same you know G allele and this population has the same T allele, right? But then then this T allele has the IBD relationship because they have the same T allele origin from the um, the common ancestor population or the base population, right? And then also you can you can easily describing that this G relationship IBS, but also has the the same common ancestor, so it should be the IBD situation too, right? Okay, so um, you can I mean when we when we look at the um, the genotype data set, we merely compare the um, the genotype information because this is the uh, one of um, the easiest way you can look at from the text file, right? I mean, we we are going to learn about that, you know, the genotype data set format in the later section. But I mean, as you expected, this is just um, you know the you know long sequence of ATGC. So if you look at the genotype information at certain locus, then you can easily say, you know. I mean, this G and this G look same. So you can easily identify, okay, so these two, you know, people has the IBS relationship, right? So that is the easiest way. But then when you, you know, want to know about, you know, whether these two Gs are from the same ancestor or not, then you have to calculate the uh, haplotypes or you have to calculate the sort of the composition of that, that haplotype area. So that case you know you have to consider certain situation which is like you know ibd or if you use the uh, familiar information for the genotyping data set then you can easily calculate the ibd situation in 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 a um you know entire family members right so ibd and ibs is you know um looks quite similar concept but you know it's um uh uh, the matter of whether you know common ancestor involved in that um, concept or not, then it's going to be IBD or IBS. Okay, so um, we, one way uh, you can measure the inbreeding, we always come up with the uh, development of coefficients. So here we also uh, use the uh, inbreeding coefficient, which is to quantify the amount of inbreeding in our population. So inbreeding coefficient, we can shortly use F. This is the, um, the, um, the terminology describing uh, probability that two alleles in multiple individuals were both descended from single allele in, a, in an ancestor, right? So this is the situation uh, to compute the probability of um, the IBD of that, that uh, alleles in, in multiple individuals, right? So we that situation, the probability that an individual is autozygous because this is the based on the IBD situation. So um, we can measure uh, inbreeding coefficient in a in a two situation. So one example in here on the left is the human, right? So if you have the full sip mating, I mean this is the what I mean. It could be extreme cases in a human population, but if you have the full seed mating, then you can you can do like parents and the uh, siblings and the mating and get the IBD um, uh, computation. Then, or if you think about the situation of peas, like you know plants, then you can design the back cross, right? So you have the parent generation. Then you have the um, the uh, F1 generation. Then you do the self fertilization. Then you get the uh, F2 generation. Then you essentially um, calculate the IBD coefficient from this situation because you have the 50% chance from the original parent generation. 
then segregate in the next generation, then you have another 50% chance of segregation. Then in the end, you get the 0.25 uh, in breeding coefficient in a second generation. And you know, likewise, we can calculate that inbreeding coefficient from a certain population. So if you imagine that certain you know, population um, assumed to be uh, inbred over the time, then you can easily calculate that inbreeding coefficient using the number of individuals uh, from the uh, starting point, then do the, um, then, then do the counting the, um, the offspring generation, then you, you, you essentially um, the compute that the coefficient of the inbreeding situation over the um, uh, multiple generation, right? So um, one way we can think about from the uh, back cross um, experiment. So if you have the back cross um, experiment and using that, uh, sorry, not back cross, is the full zip design. Then if you have the full zip design, as you see in the left side and here, then you get the, then you 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 did the experiment as a uh, inbreeding situation. Then you apply that uh, full sieve experiment over the time. Then in the end, your uh, inbreeding coefficient are going to be and converged to uh, one because it literally has the same uh, individuals in the end, right? So whatever your starting point is, the multiple individuals in a founding population. So not just the uh, one individual it has the multiple individuals, and after that you have the you have the quite high inbreeding coefficient after multiple generation. So think about the situation. People ask that you know um, certain society has the finite number of populations, so has like hundred individual like an Amish. So they migrate from the um, you know northern Europe to North America, and after multiple generation. And what will be the chance of, what will be the probability of having um, the inbreeding coefficient after, you know, um, 20th generation, right? So given you have the 100 individuals at the starting point, then you have the, um, you, then you have the number of um, alleles you can expect from the 100 individuals, then you calculate that uh, coefficient using that uh, Mendelian segregation probability, which is the 50%, then after that, you can calculate the inbreeding coefficient of the certain population in, in, in that generation, right? So this is one way we can usefully use in the estimating uh, uh, whether the population undergoes, you know, inbred, uh, total inbred situation or not, right? Because, you know, we care about that, you know, the inbreeding will be the harmful in a in a, in a phenotypic uh, consequence. And, and we're going to discuss that issue in the later section. Okay, and another way we can measure that uh, inbreeding level is the heterozygosity, right? So we, we measure the heterozygosity at the level of population. So if you, if you look at the, um, the number of uh, people having the heterozygous uh, genotype, and you can easily measure the heterozygosity. So let's say if you have the 10 individuals in a population, then five has the heterozygous um, genotype, then you can say that population one is the heterozygosity is the 50%. And this is the, just an example of single locus, right? And if you look at the population two, and this population has the heterozygosity 20%, because the you know two individuals has heterozygous genotype and population three has you know all homozygous genotypes so heterozygosity is the zero percent right so using this heterozygosity information then you can easily track down whether certain you know population will lose their heterozygosity over the time or not right as I as I you know gave I mean gave an examples of Amish uh, if they started with the hundred people in their migration and let's say you know certain locus has the you know only five percent heterozygosity in their population then after a few generations you can easily expect that you know when these heterozygosity will be disappeared right and and also. Um, we, we can use for the estimation, but also you can, you can easily track down, you know, whether that population 
undergoes that you know genetic bottlenecks or uh, genetic drift uh, using that the level of um, heterozygosity. So uh, one example is that when you, when you measure that the level of heterozygosity in the past and after a few generation, then you if you look at certain you know certain time points, then you know um, this time point has this genetic bottleneck, right? So has like a multiple individuals, but you know, only three individuals, uh, you know, pop up from the, you know, baseline population, then they migrate somewhere, right? Like Nami situation. Then these three pop, three people became founding population and they generating the genetic pool, right? And that situation happened again in here too. So this is the situation, you know, I mean, the human, natural human population normally, you know, um, get during the, you know, the history. So we can also expect that why we have, you know, loss of heterozygosity over the time or in, in a certain population, they can also explain by this, you know, the migration history as well. Or you can also measure that the level of heterozygosity at the individual genomic level, not just population. So in this case, we, uh, we use the specific term, which is the runs of homozygosity, or shortly you call it ROH, right? So this runs of homozygosity is a measure of homozygosity uh, level in an uh, in, in individual genome. Uh, sorry, it has to be changed. And this is measuring the homozygosity from individual genomes, right? Okay, so this is measured from the individual genome. But also this represents sort of the scales of uh, homozygosity in a population, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I described incorrectly, right? So, uh, so yeah, so it measured from the individual genome, but used in a population. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, I mean, this is my data, so, but, you know, I, sometimes I lost my, uh, sometimes my head is just blank. Okay, so, um, this is definitely, you know, the um, uh, the useful things because you know, runs of homozygosity is the measure by the latest genomic technology. So in the past, we kind of, you know, measured that situation. This is only, you know, done in these days. I mean, in, in particular, you know, runs, measuring the runs of homozygosity is, you know, uh, very, you know. Um, recent things so i mean even until recently this is one of the expensive things so uh people you know measure uh, runs of homozygosity using the latest genomic technology which is the next generation sequencing okay so if you look at two individual um this is the uh, data set i use for the uh, study of uh, autism spectrum disorder family in uh, um, uh, in in 2008 and this is the entire chromosome uh, two, right? So from the starting points to the end, starting point to the end. So same chromosome two. And if you look at these two individuals, uh, you probably see the differences between two individuals because this individual the, with red, it has some blank on here, right? So what this blank means. So um, it starts in these plots representing the, um, the, the, uh, genotype in 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 a, at a locus right and a single locus right so uh, I mean of course we have the three genotypes because we are diploid organisms right so we have the reference genotype uh, the reference homozygous genotype heterozygous genotype and alternative um, homozygous genotype right and then we measure the genotype by a uh, microarray. And this microarray give you some information, which is the uh, B allele frequency. This is very specific uh, case for the, um, the microarray. So not, not same as the allele frequency we described in the population. This is the B allele frequency is the measurement of the intensity of an allele, right? So if you use the microarray, you use the two allele intensity. So two allele means the A or a small A, right? So if you have um, 
large A and large A intensity at the locus, then you have the intensity, which is one, right? So intensity A is the 0.5 and 0.5. So summing up, it's one. It's very hard calculation. And if you have the large A and small A, small A has the zero intensity, I mean, for the simplicity, and then this uh, heterozygous genotype is the 0.5 plus zero. So your B allele frequency going to be 0.5. And then if you have small a and small a, which is the alternative homozygous genotype, there will be zero plus zero and not a hot calculation and that is the zero again, right? So you can easily estimate whether that locus has which genotype, right? But you, you always, Keep in mind that you know the measurement in a um, natural experiment is always give you variation, variance because you know measurement always bring you the noise, right? I mean, if you if you understand that perspective, your life and your career must be improved, right? So what that means, if you measure heterozygous genotype, then this. BLE frequency intensity has some noise, right? So expectance is the 0.5, but I mean, some of the measurements beyond the expectation. So some of the measurements like 0 0.51, 0 0.52, 0 0.55, right? But you can, you, you can broadly saying that the range between here and here will be a heterozygous genotype. Likewise, if you look at the homozygous genotype, also a bit of noise as well. And of course, we have certain measurements which is which are totally out of that you know expectation. In that case, we can call it error, right? But anyway, back to the plot. And if you look at this individual, that individual missing of multiple heterozygous genotype, right? So this area, we call that runs of homozygosity, right? Because um, this area doesn't have the heterozygosity, doesn't have the heterozygosity, I mean, bit of heterozygosity here. So, I mean, maybe blocks could be one and two, but anyway, here has total, you know, loss of heterozygosity and only homozygosity. So this part has totally a uh, homozygous genomic region, right? So that means homozygous running on that genomic region. So we simply call it runs of homozygosity. So why this runs of homozygosity happening in person's genome? The reason is that this person has a parents which, who are quite similar to each other, right? So if you do the cousin marriage or if you do the close marriage, then some of the genetic segments between your parents are quite similar. So there is a higher chance to having the recessive genotype or the, uh, not, uh, sorry, not, not recessive, homozygous genotype in their genome, right? Because they are almost identical. So identical genotypes makes you uh, large A, large A, or small A, small A, right? So, if you look at the runs of homozygosity, this represents the level of uh, inbreeding in a certain population. And if you use that information, then you can easily track down whether the, whether the individual undergoes that inbreeding situation or whether the population undergoes the inbreeding population as well. Okay, so I did miss, okay. So, okay, let's look at the worldwide view. So, First thing, um, I mean, some of the countries or the some of the region, we can expect high level of inbreeding or cousin marriage, right? So most examples is the um, uh, Middle East or the native per, uh, native uh, people in, in South America or the Oceania, right? Like in Australia or Papua New Guinea. And they have a bit of down, you know, the lower level of the heterozygosity and also they have the higher inbreeding coefficient, right? Because of their, um, the close marriage uh, culture, right? So this is the measurement from um, uh, Pemberton and Rosenberg in 2014. And they measure around like tens of um, population 
across the multiple, you know, the, um, the geography region and, and, and continent, and they measuring that uh, level of heterozygosity and, and inbreeding coefficients as well. And you can expect that the population size and the, you know, the level of that, you know, close marriage due to the, you know, uh, cultural background or the geographic isolation, we can think about that uh, level of the um, heterozygosity and inbreeding coefficient. And then a uh, more recent paper uh, looking at the uh, only um, um, mostly inbreeding, uh, sorry, mostly uh, Middle East population. So this is the one of, I mean, I mean really nice study um, uh, from the uh, um, Nature Genetics in 2016 uh, by Scott. And he looked at the uh, great Middle East region, which is like, you know, uh, Arabic country and expectedly they have higher level of the cousin marriage uh, because of their religion, because of their cultural things and, and also high level of isolation as well. And then they measure the, uh, the level of runs of homozygosity in a people's genome, right? And how many, you know, genomic portion we have the runs of homozygosity in our genome? Um, in the Middle East people, they have a run 600 million base pair out of three uh, billion base pair in their genome, which is around you know 10 to 20 percent of their genomes, right? And this is way higher proportion than you know other countries like you know European and and African. But surprisingly, you know if you compare with the East Asian, East Asian also has the uh, total you know you know the sum of the uh, runs of homozygosity in our genomes as well but difference is that if you look at the length of runs of homozygosity you know the middle east people they have longer runs of homozygosity size than east asian the reason is that they have much higher level of the cousin marriage because they have high chance of having the same segment in the from the you know the family um, uh, um, the relationship, right? So that's why they have much larger segments of the runs homozygosity in their genome. So given the information, we can we can put it into a more generalized situation describing how we understand these uh, runs homozygosity pattern in the population, right? So I think this is one of the key figure you have to understand in, the, in, in this topic. So we have two things. So first is the x-axis on here is the sum of the runs of homozygosity. So if you look at the 3 billion base pair genome in our, in our body, then how many, you know, I mean, no, how, how much total you have runs of homozygosity in your DNA, right? And if you have the number of runs of homozygosity in your genome, and how many times runs of homozygosity happen in our uh, genome, right? So one um, uh, reference is the larger population. So if you think about the, you know, the large population like an African, like then you have um, the proportion of the certain, the size, uh, some of the runs of homozygosity, and did I? Okay, some and the number. Okay, and the number of runs of homozygosity, and and the, each point represent individual, right? So most of people has around this range, and if you look at admixed population, which is you know um, like cosmopolitan people, and they married with totally different genetic background. Uh, person and they are likely to, you know, they are unlikely to be in inbreeding situation. So in that case, some of the runs of homozygosity and the total number of runs of homozygosity getting lower, right? And then if you look at the smaller population and if you compare with the larger population, then it will be increase of the sum of runs of homozygosity and the number of runs of homozygosity, right? Then, then you compare with the consanguineous population, which is the very close uh, marriage, right? Then you can expect that the number of runs of homozygosity is quite similar to small population, but some of the runs of homozygosity getting increased. The reason is that 
the size of the runs on is getting bigger. So that's why they're likely to have, you know, much more runs on in their genome, right? That makes sense, right? And if you look at the bottleneck and consanguineous family, then this is much smaller population size than small population. So both some of the runs of and the number of runs of is getting, you know, increased. But some of the runs of is more uh, increased than that, right? Uh, one thing I missed in here is, you know, uh, if you look at the um, the runs of the the average size is around 500 KB to 10 million base pair. So runs of homogeneity happen at scale around 100 kilobase. So that is sort of the expectation. So your expectation, you can draw the line to diagonal here, right? Because you can you can use that, you know, the average size as coefficient and times the number of events you, you can normally measure from the population uh, from the individual, right? So you can draw the diagonal diagonal lines because this is simple y equals ax plus b, right? But if you look at the consanguineous family, whatever is the consanguineous or with bottleneck, that that case, the average size is going to be increased. So that's why it's a little bit shifted toward right because the, the sum is going to be increased, right? And bottleneck is the much smaller size than the smaller population. So if you understand the relationship between the sum of runs homogeneity and the number of runs homogeneity in a, each population, then you can easily you can easily estimate you know um, I mean why runs homogeneity happening in our genome and how we interpret that one in 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 modern genomic data set. Okay, so what is the implication in inbreeding? So. Back to Darwin. So uh, if you think about Darwin, um, I mean, he lost three children. And I mean, of course, I mean, as a parent, he would be devastated, right? So I mean, lost two young kids and lost, you know, one, you know, um, teenager. And I, I mean, I, get, I guess that Darwin would be, I mean, um, destroyed in, in his feeling, right? Then Darwin always asked that, you know, um, that's it, that, you know, that's probably cause of the, um, uh, I mean, caused from his cousin marriage. Because, you know, Darwin always thought about the natural selection, you know, evolution of the biological organisms. So why, why only he thought about the, you know, the, you know, um, the disadvantage of the, um, the, the finite, population marriage, right? So he he worried about the situation and he always asked that, you know, whether inbreeding has some, you know, bad things in the phenotypic development, right? So that 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 there won't be the surprising things, but what's surprising things is he look at that, you know, the inbreeding situation using the using the peas, right? So everyone used peas, not just Mendel at the time. So Darwin, again, used the peas in his experiment. So he did, he, he developed the experiments using peas, using the cross-fertilization and self-fertilization. And you can expect that the self-fertilization mimicked the inbreeding situation and cross-fertilization mimicked the upbreeding situation. Then he can, he can easily see, you know, the consequence of this cross or self fertilization in, in the phenotypic development. And surprisingly, that is from the 19th century. And what he found, he definitely see some, you know, the developmental growth, developmental, you know, uh, disadvantage in a uh, self uh, fertilization. And he can easily, you know, implicate the situation into the inbreeding, um, uh, inbreeding disadvantage, right? So, I mean, not just Darwin, but other natural, naturalists or uh, geneticists, they thought about the inbreeding situation and people, you know, usually discuss how inbreeding makes bad things in, in a population and phenotypic development. And one, one terminology describing that uh, phenomena is the inbreeding depression. 
So if you mate uh, between close relate relatives, that could have a detrimental consequence on the survival and fertility of resulting offspring. So after self-pollination of these plants uh, over several generations, inbreeding the depression gradually reduced heterozygosity, of course, because I mean the, the reduced of the uh, genetic pool and increased the inbreeding coefficient and also reduced the vigor in a hybrid plants, right? So the hybrid plants are uh, getting, uh, you know, the bad uh, phenotypic values in their, um, in their, um, in their organisms, right? And, and also it occurs in wild animals and plant population as well as humans, right? So indicating that genetic variation in fitness trait exists in natural population. And we all learned from the, you know, the, you know, uh, disadvantage of uh, close marriage uh, from uh, con consanguineous family in terms of the um, um, disease aspect, right? So if you if you think about the alcaptonuria found by uh, uh, Archibald Garrett, he also describing the situation of the congenital disorder from the consanguineous family, right? Uh, likewise, we see lots of, you know, uh, you know, congenital defects uh, from the congenious, uh, consanguineous family. So that's why there was the one of the reason why, I mean, some countries abandoned the, you know, cousin marriage in their society. Uh, inbreeding depression is important in the evolution of outcrossing mating system and of course, people always thought about the situation in an, in an agriculture and the breeding system. So one way uh, people come up with the idea is the heterosis. So heterosis is the situation improving performance of heterozygous F1 hybrid compared to genetically different uh, homozygous parents. So the, um, the plants with the heterozygous genotype they have much better um, uh, phenotypic values, which is like, you know, the size or the ability to adapt in a certain environmental situation. You know, the, um, the F1 heterozygous always uh, manifest the better performance than homozygous genotype, right? So in, in that sense, heterosis also um, uh, dealt in the, in, in certain agriculture, uh, the topics, but I mean, people still debate about whether you know the inbreeding depression disadvantage or advantage in a certain environment because you know environment is always dynamic and also it has to interpret in in different contexts, right? Like in agriculture or the breeding field or like humans or like you know even humans like you know we we have different you know whatever. Um, uh, physical or physiological or uh, psychological differences, and in 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 each situation, you know, we we have to deal with different, you know, uh, genetic architecture or and and also the phenotypic variance in 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 a population. So some situation people think the inbreeding depression may have certain environmental adaptation or fitness situation, or you know conventionally thought and breeding dep depression is you know bad so heterozygous takes advantage and that is much you know better than others right and mostly these topics you know discussed in the in in agriculture and plant science compared to like you know uh human biomedical science the reason is that you know um looking at the plant lineage and and plant, you know, experiment is much easier and much simplified um, version than human things because, you know, we can control plant lineage, we can control animal stocks, but we cannot control uh, human lineage, right? <laughs> because human always made whatever they want, right? So uh, that's why the experimental design for understanding like an overdominant situation like in here, or like, you know, recessive patterns. I mean, this is one of the classic genetic terms you probably learned in a general biology or high school science, right? 
But these things, I mean, most of the examples are actually from the uh, plant or uh, animals, which are under the control, right? Mm -hmm. But these these topics is still new in human genetics, right? Because you know we don't have that many data set, and we don't have the you know the full understanding of our social activities. So how to configure that? issues into the into the um, uh, genetic studies so it's still ongoing process to understand you know this key terminology we we discussed in the plant and and animals right so so sometimes you know um like you know students like you i mean have the biological background and of course you are a biology major and some students argue that you know why professor i mean we learned about the overdominance or we learned about the recessive we learned about the epistasis epistasis in um in a you know you know the general biology book or high school book but why these things not appeared in your lecture the reason is that the these things is mostly studied in the well-controlled plant or animal science, but you're not gonna study plant or animal, right? So if you study plant or animals, I mean, it's yours, but you know, in humans, I mean, these things still ongoing. So we still, I mean, people still, uh, I mean, people means that the geneticist in human genetics, they are still working on how epistasis is working in a human trait or how overdominance is working in a human trait because, you know, we 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 now just have you know larger data set we now have the developing the methodology to do that so so good thing is you can look up some you know the conclusions or discussion from uh, other you know natural populations like a plants or animals i mean that could be great but don't be oversimplified into the human genetics because we are still ongoing to study that that issues right so there, there is one message for that so um one example is we looking at the inbreeding depression in humans is you know definitely looking at the recessive genetic patterns in consanguineous marriage right these things you know long been studied from the uh archibald garrett uh, i mean it's early 20th century so about century year ago right 100 years ago and 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 again i mean after umim and after a few uh, project people looking at the recessive patterns and mostly in a rare disease area but this is again the very premature stops i mean compared to what we've done in the plants and animals right so people wants to put it into more elegant way so think about like a polygenic uh, aspects and think about more reproducibility, reproducibility, and or more like you know better experimental design. So in the sense, large um, genetic cohorts coming out from the major society like UK Biobank, right? So as I explained last time, and also lots of genomic consortium we're going to cover in the next session, and and also you know even like in Korea we all we all going to that direction as well. So in using that data set, you can easily track down how inbreeding depression diminish our um, phenotypic values or whether it's influence your uh, trait values in, in, in the sense, right? So this is one of the, um, the early efforts looking at the inbreeding depression in our population, human, right? You human, me human. And we're looking at that inbreeding depression for the physical traits like hand grip strength, weight hip ratio, visual and auditory equity, right? Then what they measure is the around 2.3 or 5.2, which is the standard deviation scale, which is you know converted to Z score uh, within the normal distribution, and that is the around you know two to five percent reduction in because of the inbreeding depression, right? So we can quantify uh, in the context of the polygenic uh, aspect, right? Okay. Um, okay, this is the, the things. And, and 
another interesting data set coming up from UK again. Um, so uh, this is the uh, study of genetic study of the 3000 UK dwelling adults that resident in a, in a, I think it's a Bradford region. And they have the huge, um, the suburb where Pakistani immigrants live. And they collected the uh, data set from that region and they measured the inbreeding patterns because the immigrants, they're likely to marry to each other. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, hopefully they mixed with others, but you know, it's, it's not easy because of the assertative situation. So uh, people want to ask the question whether these inbreeding patterns, you know, um, um, give some consequence on our trade values, right? So what they found is they found some genetic patterns, of course, that's one thing. And also they found the high level of inbreeding, like an ROH pattern as well. And also they found some, you know, genetic regions related to these inbreeding and developmental issues, right? And this Nara Shimhan's paper, I think he's the, I think he's almost um, only person studying ransom diagnosis in this area. Um, this is the science paper. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really good to read. I mean, this is really elegant paper. I really love the paper. Uh, and then not opening. <laughs> Great. Okay, our university internet is awesome. Um, okay, so if you look at here, the Narashiman, uh, uh, Vakish Narashiman is from the Richard Dobbins group. He's one of the greatest um, geneticists as well. And this is the one study looking at the, um, the, the consequence of the, um, the, the inbreeding patterns. So they specifically looking at the uh, knockout mutation, which is here describing the recessive mutation. And what he found that this recessive or homozygous mutation not just appeared as a singleton, it appears in a um, consequence, uh, sorry, in, in, in a series, right? So which is the runs of homozygous D. That was really surprised to us because, you know, we never expect that, you know, recessive mutation happens in a row, right? I mean, I mean, recessive mutation itself is quite scary because it's the recessive, but how, how this recessive mutation can be happening in a row, right? Like uh, many recessive mutation in a, you know, five kilobase or 10 million base pairs, right? Mutation is only one, two base pairs, right? So uh, how can these things happen, right? So I was totally great by this study in, in 2017, so I, 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 I beat, onto that uh, subject as well, but I, I, you know, I stopped during my um, time, but, you know, I mean, I back to the topics these days, but this is one of the things we can consider in, in, in modern days. The reason is that, you know, uh, lots of um, the uh, genetic studies uh, for the uh, clinical perspective, people looking at the autosomal dominant, which is the mostly de novo mutation, and the common variant, which is the, um, the additive perspective. And there is no really good experimental design for um, recessive patterns in human population, especially like a biomedical science. Then this paper came out, and this paper suggests that the, um, the way of looking at how we understand the recessive um, mutation in a clinical condition, right? And this is the examples of consanguineous family, but the level of consanguineous family is actually, you know, maintained in the past and suddenly changed in modern society. So there must be some, you know, the, the background level of consanguinity in, in, in our, you know, human population. And that, that has to be understood because that probably could some consequence to, 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 you know, present generations. So, I mean, this is definitely one way we can think about that, you know, uh, the, the study notion. And then, yeah, and the same, uh, okay. 
Then another thing, uh, this is not about the whatever inheritance or whatever um, evolution, something, something, but you know, the one rhetoric, you know, comparison about, you know, uh, cancers in human evolution is like, you know, cancer cells behave like human evolution, right? And these things you're going to cover in the, uh, the metabolism or cancer biology in, in our department uh, by Professor um, Sung Kim. But uh, if, you, if you look at the cancer cells, the cancer cells is actually uh, start from the certain mutation, which is like a somatic de novo mutation. And normal cells um, by stochastical events or certain, you know, um, uh, uh, exposure, like, you know, carcinogen, and that cell has certain mutation in their genome, right? And this mutation and this cell became founder, like, you know, the founder in a common ancestor. And these cells having lineage, like, you know, when we understand about the co as coalescent lineage, right? So within the within certain tissue, these founder cells are not subject to apoptosis, which means that this is not gonna be died, not gonna be killed by you know the immune system. They proliferate whatever they want and they dominate their cell numbers in the certain tissue. So if you compare the situation with the uh, human population, right? So that cells genotype entirely dominate certain tissue, then that's gonna be a problem, right? That's going to be a major phenomena we found in a, um, the patient with cancers, right? So in that case, we can expect that the, the mutation, uh, the allele frequency going to dominate in their genome. So what that means is that the founding mutation, founding the novel somatic mutation going to be majorly uh, occupied in the tissue. So if you look at the tissue, tumor tissue, then you will see all of the cells will have the mutation in their genome. That means they totally lose of their heterozygosity, right? Because if the cells has the mixture of um, multiple, you know, normal cells that will maintain the um, the heterozygous level in their genome, because if you look at the uh, the level of population, but in the end, all of the cells will be identical as the founder tumor cell, founder somatic cells. So that will have all the same genotype in the end, right? So this is again the same, you know, the comparison we described in the embreeding. So I, I, I just put as a, you know, if you, um, as a, the examples of the embreeding in a, in a cancer situation. Okay, so this is good. And we covered the three topics, the uh, embreeding depression concept and the um, measurement and also the implication. And hope you enjoy the um, the topics and also some further readings you can find in 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 the external link. And also, as I um, announced last Monday, we're going to cover the the review session on on Monday class, and we'll follow up with the um, the second exam on on Wednesday. Um, I, I I know that the um, this is like um exam period in, in our time, uh, in, in our university. So I mean, students might feel burdened in uh, preparing the exams, but you know, the first thing is the preparing exams is always um, after the class. So that is the one thing, if you feel late, it's really late, right? So it's never going to, you know, backtracking your time, there's no such things, right? So this is the 101 you have to learn in your adulthood time. And the second thing is university is watching us. So if you miss the class and that will, um, they will not kill you, but they will, you know, kill me. So, I mean, they tracking how many classes we done. So um, I don't know, uh, I mean, my time university, I mean, we, if we have the absence of the class, that will be, you know, the one of the joy 
in my university day, but these days, you know, uh, Minister of Education and University, they never allow us to do that. So I always dream, you know, the missing the class, but I mean, there's no such things happening in my time. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, this is recording, so I, I shouldn't say that, but okay. So prepare your exam. And if you have any question, comments, and you know, um, anything, uh, leave on the Slack and we can discuss uh, further in the, the time. And, and of course, it's, it's always welcome and also encourage you to you put some, uh, you know, the, the questions before the review time, then I can prepare some, you know, the, the weakness part, we can recover that issue, right? Okay, so it's good. And hopefully everyone um, have the safe time over your exam period and get the good score and, and a good weekend and see you next time.